Um, and I'm joined by Beth Hayward today, one of our wonderful nurse practitioners, who's also um, part of our team. So we both work in the high-risk skin, um, and we're going to talk with you all today about skin cancer after transplant, um, including what to know and how to protect yourself. So um, before we get started, I wanted to briefly introduce you to our transplant dermatology team at Penn. So we have a Penn Dermatology Oncology Center that includes um, four clinics that specialize in diagnosing and treating skin cancer, um, including our high-risk skin cancer clinic for organ transplant patients. Um, and this is our team. So it's a big team that includes um, medical dermatologists like myself, as well as wonderful nurse practitioners and um, a team of Mohs surgeons who are specialized dermatology surgeons um, who treat skin cancer, particularly um, high-risk skin cancer, um, including in transplant patients. So we have a wonderful team at Penn really who can Kind of manage all of your, um, you know, skin cancers from diagnosis to treatment, as well as other um, skin conditions that affect transplant patients. So skin cancer is the most common malignancy that we see after transplant. Um, so we know that compared to the general population, cancer in general is two times more likely to happen in transplant patients but for um, skin cancer in particular, transplant patients are 16 times more likely to develop skin cancer after transplant. Um, so what we wanna talk about today um, are two things. One is how to prevent skin cancers, and two is how to detect skin cancers as early as possible. So um, first, I'm gonna turn it over um, to Beth so that um, she can talk with us a little bit about what we can do to decrease the risk for skin cancer. Okay, so what I'm gonna start with is um, basically just kind of first reviewing the fundamentals. So um, for, for this, this means um, just kind of knowing about ultraviolet light. So the sun emits ultraviolet light, UVA, UVB, and UVC. Um, UVA is the, uh, ultraviolet light that causes aging, including wrinkles and sunspots, and then UVB causes um, sunburn. You'll see here, this is my six-month-old um, son, and I give a similar face when I see a patient with a sunburn. Um, it is definitely not my most favorite thing to see, particularly, obviously, in transplant patients who um, are at a higher risk. So, um, so why do we care about the effects of the UV light? Um, so, Short-term effects, like I mentioned, sunburn, um, tanning, and then some of the long-term effects, um, like aging, dark spots, wrinkles, and then obviously your increased risk for skin cancer. So uh, we know that compliance with sun protection measures is for an organ transplant recipients, um, particularly in patients 50 years or older and um, also in men. Um, so one example that we have had in our um, clinic is a 65-year-old kidney transplant recipient on Prograf and Prednisone. He worked on a ferry um, that transports tourists, and he had um, over 50 skin cancers. Um, so we know that these patients are, um, you know, when they've had a lot of sun exposure prior to their transplant, obviously all, um, increases their risk as well. So. Um, so what is the most effective way to protect your skin from the sun? Um, and that would be avoiding sun exposure. Um, obviously, it's a little hard to avoid sun exposure altogether. So we're also going to kind of review um, the measures that you can take to uh, protect yourself when you are outdoors. So UVB intensity peaks from 10 to 2. And again, the UVB is um, the cause for burning of the skin. A uh, UVA exposure is relatively constant through, throughout daylight hours. So you can see here, um, so the peak hours, you know, like I had mentioned between 10 and two, ideally if you can avoid those times, um, particularly kind of going outside early in the morning, later in the afternoon, if you can, um, those are kind of the ideal times to, to partake in outdoor activities. Um, so what else can you do to protect yourself from the sun? So this is a nice little thing that you can kind of remember. So slip on a shirt, slap on a hat, slap on sunscreen, 
wrap on sunglasses to protect your eyes and sensitive skin around them. So sun protective clothing is a very nice option that we have these days. Um, what the clothing stands for, so um, it's ultraviolet protective factor. So you see um, a lot of uh, sun protective clothing has that tag with a UPF on it. Um, so ultraviolet protective factor are standards used to measure sunburn protection of fabrics. So you wanna look for a UPF factor of 50 or higher, because that's gonna give you um, the most um, sun protection. And then, so most fabrics that we wear are a loose weave that lets visible light peek through and get to our skin. With UPF clothing, the weave is different and oftentimes is made from a special fabric to help form a barrier against the sun's rays. Most protected fabrics are UPF 50 or higher, so better than typical SPF sunscreen. We recommend using a combination of both sun protective clothing and sunscreen. Um, and then when it comes to the life cycle and washing of your clothing, so um, we do know that um, after about two to three years, the effectiveness does go down a little bit. So we do recommend, um, you know, if you're washing your clothes multiple times throughout the summer, wearing them a lot, that you kind of invest again about two, three years later. Um, so sun protective clothing. So these are some of the tags that you can look for. Again, it's um, the UPF and there's a little 50 plus on it. Um, that would be ideal. And then where you can find them. So there's a lot of different um, brands that actually make the UPF clothing now. You can just kind of Google um, UPF clothing. Amazon has a bunch and there's, um, you know, even just Patagonia, um, Columbia, all the kind of sportswear companies also make them too. Um, they also make sun protective hats. So um, again, also having the ultraviolet protective factor um, built into the hats, which is a nice option. Um, hats are extremely important to protect um, the sides of the face, the ears, um, the neck. So really important to, to really wear a wide brim hat. Um, one of our surgeons, Dr. Miller, his rule of thumb if the, is if the people aren't making fun of your hat, then your brim isn't wide enough. So the wider, the better. So this is um, an example of a patient who, a transplant patient who um, is obviously at high risk for skin cancer. You can see that, you know, his shirt did protect a lot of his um the chest, arms, uh, but did not protect the neck. And he also was not wearing a wide brim hat. So you can see that he did get some sun exposure on the cheeks, on the ears, and the neck. So um, it really is important to cover up everywhere. So sunscreen, um, we know it's overwhelming. So we'd like to address this with you um, and just kind of go through some of the basics and what to look for in your sunscreen. So um, in 2011, the FDA issued some sunscreen labeling rules to standardize the information on sunscreen products. Um, broad spectrum protection, um, only if they, so broad spectrum is uh, basically against UVA and UVB. So you wanna make sure that it says um, broad spectrum and then waterproof, sweatproof and sunblock were banned because they thought it was um, too confusing or misleading. So you wanna make sure that your sunscreen says water resistant um, and it should specify if it provides protection for um, 40 to or 80 minutes. Um, so there are a lot of different sunscreens out there. The, um, what we have recently um, you know, had in our sunscreen is uh, physical blockers. So you hear a lot of um, zinc and titanium dioxide um, so we know that the chemical sunscreens, the way that they work is absorbs the UVA and UVB rays. Um, we recommend using, putting them on about uh, 15, 20 minutes before you go outside. So um, because it takes a little while for them to be effective. Um, physical sunscreens, they bounce off the UVA and UVB rays and they're effective immediately. Um, these are, we typically just kind of run through the consumer reports um, sunscreen. So these are a few of the top rated lotions um, of 2021 by Consumer Reports, reports, which is an American nonprofit organization dedicated to unbiased product testing. Um, so these are just some examples of ones that, that were top rated lotions. 
And then these were some of the top rated sprays um, from this year. There is um, just a little note here that when you're using spray sunscreens, you wanna make sure that um, when you are spraying them, that you're rubbing them in and covering all areas. Um, I do like some of the zinc ones for that reason, because I feel like I can see where the sunscreen is actually, um, you know, where I'm applying it and rubbing it in. Um, the, the other thing with the spray sunscreens is um, the FDA is investigating poten potential risks associated with inhaling spray sunscreens. Um, so definitely caution, you know, in children and avoiding sprays directly on the face. And then these were some of the top rated um, chemical sunscreens. So again, the chemical sunscreens with the zinc and titanium dioxide. Um, these are both actually, um, I believe, children's sunscreens, but they're um, the chemical sunscreens that were top rated for this year. So some of our personal favorites, um, I really like Elta MD, is, uh, especially like a daily SPF moisturizer. It has zinc in it. Um, I loved the La Roche-Posay products. Um, Neutrogena has great products. Um, again, this the Babo is a, a spray um, sheer zinc sunscreen that I like, and then uh, CeraVe line as well. Okay, so in terms of sunscreen, I obviously just gave you a bunch of different recommendations, but um, honestly, the best sunscreen is the one that you like and that you're gonna apply to the skin. Um, and applying to the skin liberally and also, um, you know, every one to two hours when kind of swimming, sweating. Um, so some of our sunscreen tips. So use a sunscreen with the highest SPF that you like using. Um, SPF 30 or higher is ideal. Um, when your SPF is um, a 30, it's blocking about 97% of the UV rays, uh, where when you're getting a little bit higher, um, you know, with 50, it's about 98%. So it's really about the reapplication of um, the sunscreens so that you're getting that constant um, protection. You want to apply your sunscreens 15 to 30 minutes before going outside, particularly if those are the sunscreens, um, the chemical sunscreens. Um, apply liberally. So a good rule of thumb is at least one teaspoon per body part. And then you also wanna make sure you're reapplying at least every two hours. And then again, reapplying after swimming or sweating. So sunscreen is the most effective anti-aging product you can put on your skin. So um, that's another added benefit to sunscreen. Um, so you can see here, which I don't know if we have the other picture of, um, yes, here we go. So this is a photo of a truck driver. It's a, um, a pretty common photo that's out there. So um, this illustrates the effects of long-term sun exposure and skin aging. So you can see um, on the photo on the right, he's had a lot of sun damage, um, wrinkles, sunspots, all those uh, effects from the sun. Okay, so factor myth, um, rigorous sun protection can cause vitamin D insufficiency. And this is a fact. Um, so we know that um, that sun exposure, um, you know, we can get some vitamin D from that. Um, my, my vitamin D is always low. So um, I'm always taking a vitamin D supplement, um, you know, trying to get it also through foods, um, eggs, fish, milk, things like that. So um, recommended, you know, if you are very good about your sun protection, making sure that you're also having that checked, um, you know, with your primary or your transplant team. Um, so factor myth, if you stay under a beach umbrella, you don't need sunscreen. This is a myth. Um, so we know um, surfaces like snow, sand, pavement, and water reflect much of the UV radiation that reaches them. Because of this reflection, UV intensity can be deceptively high even in shaded areas. So the, the sand reflects about 17% of the UV radiation. So you still need to wear sunscreen and protective clothing if you're relaxing under an umbrella on the beach. Um, factor myth, if it's cloudy outside, you don't need sunscreen. 
this is a myth. Um, so clouds only block about 20% of the UV radiation from the sun. So you can still get sunburn on a cloudy day. In addition, clouds may take away the warming warning that um, you typically get with the sun. So factor myth tinted windows help block UV light. So um, there's, it's a little bit of both actually, which can be confusing. So some window tinting materials also incorporate UV blocking, where this is not uniform. So window tinting is intended to block a visible light, not UV light. So factor myth, the front windshield and side windows of a car block 95% of the UV rays. And this is a myth. Okay, and then um, sunscreens that contain inse insect repellent are as effective as using the two products separately. This is a myth. So um, typically our recommendations for um, insect repellent are applying your sunscreen first, um, making sure that that's effective and then um, then the bug spray. Um, sunscreens need to be applied generously and often, like we had mentioned, and an insect repellent should be used sparingly and much less frequently. Okay, and now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Steele to um, review um, knowing how to detect skin cancers. All right. Thanks so much, Beth. Um, so as you can see, um, there are a lot of different measures that you can take um, to try to prevent skin cancer. But if you do develop um, skin cancer, you also want to have um, the tools to be able to detect it um, as early as possible. So why is it important to detect skin cancer early? Um, so we know that early diagnosis can save lives. So almost all skin cancers start at an early curable stage. So what we'll talk about today are the three most common type of skin cancers that we see in transplant patients um, and some tips about how to detect them as early as you can. So number one is squamous cell carcinoma. So this is the most common type of skin cancer that we see in transplant patients. And transplant recipients are actually 65 to 250 times more likely to get squamous cell skin cancer compared to the general population. So much higher risk. And how do you spot a squamous cell skin cancer? So these tend to be pink scaly spots on sun exposed areas and they may develop from precancerous lesions called actinic keratoses that I'll review as well. And squamous cell um, carcinomas tend to occur on skin with repeated and chronic sun exposure. So this is where the sun protection really you know, comes um, into play. So for most people, um, the, these areas with chronic sun exposure include the head and neck, as well as the forearms, the back of the hands, and the lower legs. And again, how do you spot a squamous cell skin cancer? So these tend to be pink scaly spots on sun exposed areas. So these are two examples here, one on the top of the ear, which is definitely a sun exposed area, and one here on the forearm. Um, so both in sun exposed areas, pink scaly spots. And then um, we also sometimes see pigmented squamous cell skin cancers. So that's a subtype of squamous cell that's more common in patients of darker skin types. So Asian and black transplant patients are more likely to get pigmented squamous cell skin cancers. Um, so these tend to be brown rather than pink, but are still scaly spots that are most common in sun exposed areas. So, so this is an example of a pigmented squamous cell um, on this patient's finger and one on the lower leg. And then I mentioned actinic keratoses, which are a precancerous lesion of squamous cell skin cancer. Um, so these also tend to be most common in sun exposed areas, so head and neck, as well as the back of the hands. Um, and they appear as these rough pink spots. So I often tell patients that these are spots that you can sometimes feel better than you can see. 
Um, but you know, sometimes they can be a little bit subtle to pick up. And why do we care about actinic keratoses? So um, we care because a small portion of actinic keratoses can evolve into squamous cell skin cancers. So this is an example of a patient who has multiple um, actinic keratoses, um, which you can see these small um, pink scaly spots um, or rough spots on the forehead, and then has developed the squamous cell skin cancer within it. Um, okay, and then moving on to basal cell carcinoma. So this is the second most common type of skin cancer that we see in transplant patients. Um, and transplant recipients are about 10 times more likely to develop basal cell relative to the general population. So how do you spot a basal cell skin cancer? These usually appear as pink, shiny spots that sometimes bleed and are also most common on sun-exposed areas. Um, so for basal cell skin cancers, 82% of these happen on the head and neck. Um, so much more common on the head and neck, but we certainly do see them on the trunk and extremities as well. Um, and as I mentioned, basal cell skin cancers are really pink, shiny, and they can bleed. So those are the things to look out for for a basal cell carcinoma. Um, and there is a, also a sub, subtype um, of basal cell carcinoma that's pigmented. So those tend to be um, brown or pink and brown um, and also are shiny um, and tend to bleed. And again, most common in sun exposed areas. So you can see here, um, both of these are lesions on the face. And then finally, melanoma is the third most common type of skin cancer that we see in transplant patients. Um, and transplant recipients are about four times more likely to develop melanoma relative to the general population. So how do you spot a melanoma? This um, melanomas tend to be irregular brown spots. Um, the other things to look out for are new moles or changing moles. So which of these skin cancers is most likely to be life-threatening? Basal cell, squamous cell, or melanoma? And in this case, um, melanoma. So um, melanoma causes 75% um, of all deaths from skin cancer. And that's despite the fact that the basal cell and squamous cell skin cancers are much more common. Um, but importantly, what percentage of melanomas can be cured if they're detected early enough? So the answer to this is 90%. So that's really you know, um, a good example of why we emphasize early detection, because um, even with melanoma, um, which is you know, the, the skin cancer that we often are most worried about, 90% um, can be cured if we detect it in an early stage. Um, so um, early detection of melanoma, often we talk about the A, B, C, D, E's of melanoma, which I'll go through um, briefly. So A is asymmetry. Um, so if you look at a mole and compare the two sides, um, they, they will look different. B is border irregularity. So looking at um, a melanoma, if it has an irregular border, that's a concern. Um, C is for colors, so any color variation in a mole is a concern. So you can see here, this mole has multiple different colors within it, pink, brown, black, so that's definitely a concern. D is for diameter, so we worry about um, moles that are bigger, um, so in particular moles that are greater than six millimeters. And then E is for evolving, um, so any change in a mole is something um, that it is worthwhile to talk to your dermatologist about. Um, so you wanna watch out for new moles and moles that are changing. So any change in size, color, or elevation of one of your moles is you know, a reason to um, get in touch with your dermatologist and have them take a look at that spot. So now that we've reviewed the three most common types of skin cancer that we see in transplant patients, um, how, how can we detect these as, as early as possible? So one of the things that we really emphasize in, in transplant patients other than sun protection is self skin exam. So ideally this is something you wanna do on about a monthly basis at home. Um, and 
either you, you can do it on your own using a hand mirror um, or with the help of a partner um, or family member or friend. Um, but what you really want to do is take a good look at your skin from head to toe. Um, so that means not forgetting your underarms, your back, your buttocks, the genital area, the palms and soles, the fingers um, and toenails. We really want a good look from head to toe. Even though skin cancers most commonly happen in sun exposed areas, we definitely can see them anywhere on the body. Um, and then the other thing that's um, important is regular skin checks with your dermatologist. So for all transplant patients, we recommend um, a complete skin exam with a dermatologist at least once per year. And then for transplant patients with a history of skin cancer, often your dermatologist will recommend more frequent skin checks. So we may recommend every three to six months, depending on your skin cancer history and other risk factors. So the take home message from Beth um, and my presentation today is one that you have the ability to decrease your risk for skin cancer, primarily through sun protection, and two, that you have the ability to detect skin cancers before they're dangerous. And that's with self skin exams at home as well as, well as regular, regular skin checks with your dermatologist. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Dr. Thuzar Shin. Um, who's one of our um, wonderful Mohs surgeons and the director of our high-risk skin cancer clinic for organ transplant and immunosuppressed patients. Um, and Dr. Shin's gonna talk to us um, briefly about how we treat skin cancers. Thanks so much, Catherine. And thank you everybody for tuning in today. I hope you've learned a lot. Um, those are really great presentations from Beth and from Dr. Steele. And we can use um, either the chat function or um, if you look under the Q question and answer tab at the bottom of your screen, um, Beth has answered about five questions and there's a couple that are still open. Um, so feel free to type in um, any questions that you might have for us and we'd love to get to them in real time. Um, if we don't, we'll try to get to them in the discussion session um, at the end of this presentation. So I am going to briefly discuss um, and keep it very simple, ways to treat skin cancers if you do end up developing one. Okay, so um, like Catherine or doc, like, like Dr. Steele was um, mentioning, you know, the three most common skin cancers we'll talk about are basal cell, squamous cell, carcinomas, and melanomas. Um, and just to reiterate, they are from different cell types. So basal cell and squamous cell cancers are from keratinocyte cells, which are which make up the skin, the layers of the skin. And then melanomas are derived from melanocytes, which are also, um, they also reside in the skin, but they're completely different from keratinocytes. Um, so really very briefly or very in general, basal cell and squamous cell cancers have more treatment options depending on really the size and how deeply they're in, um, how deeply they're growing in the skin. And so, especially when you find these early and they're small and superficial, there's more treatment options for basal cell and squamous cell cancers. In contrast, melanoma, which is really the least common type of skin cancer that we talked about today, but can be a threat to your health. We almost always treat these by cutting them out. So before we decide, you know, together as a team, you know, um, what type of treatment you'll need for your skin cancer, a biopsy needs to be done. So that is to confirm the diagnosis underneath the microscope. And this is, this is usually done um, under local anesthesia. Many times we can do it without putting any stitches in the skin. And so just to, re to repeat that a biopsy is done for a diagnosis um, and it's not actual treatment and you and your, your doctor can discuss or your provider can discuss what type of treatment is appropriate for your type of skin cancer. Um, so for example, this is a, you know, this is Dr. Miller, who's one of our most surgeons to we biopsied a basal cell from his back. Um, and so as providers, we get a pathology report back from our uh, dermatopathologist. And in this case, this is a basal cell carcinoma on the back. We're gonna think about kind of the location, the size, the type of skin cancer. And in this case, we're gonna recommend an excision, which we'll talk about later. So in very broad categories, there are two main types of treatments that we consider for skin cancers. Um, on the left column are considered destructive treatments, um, which include scraping with a curette, freezing with liquid nitrogen, and topical creams. And there are several that we have 
um, that we can use for these precancers and superficial skin cancers. For destructive, destructive treatments, you do not have stitches. So you really don't have very much in the way of limitation after you have a destructive treatment uh, for your skin cancer. There are two types of excision that we'll talk about. And this is, in general, this is cutting with a scalpel. And most of the time we'll cut the skin out, cut the skin with a margin of normal looking skin and then stitch it up most of the time. We'll talk about two types of excisions that we think about for skin cancers as well. Um, so the reason why precancers such as actinic keratoses, which uh, Dr. Steele mentioned, can turn into uh, squamous cell carcinomas. And um, the reason why these precancers and superficial basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas can be treated with destructive therapy sometimes is because if they're located very high up or very, um, very close to the surface of the skin, confined to the epidermis, um, and sometimes into the, you know, the next layer of skin, but very, very high up, um, we can consider destructive treatments because those skin cancers are accessible to external treatments um, such as scraping, freezing, and creams. This is an example of a liquid nitrogen canister. Some of you have, may have seen this if you've been to the dermatologist. We use this very commonly to treat actinic keratoses. Uh, we freeze them um, and uh, many times we'll do them without a biopsy because it's a clinical diagnosis. So there's no pathology done, but we do assess response to treatment. So you know, liquid nitrogen is, is very cold. It can sometimes cause a blister or some scabbing, but usually this will heal up you know, very nicely in a week. Um, so we reserve some topical treatments when there are many, many actinic keratoses or many superficial lesions. So for example, um, this gentleman on the left had a lot of actinic keratoses kind of really on the entire surface of the face. And um, we prescribe a topical chemotherapy cream for this to really help um, elicit a local inflammatory response so that your body can fight off the atypical cells. And what you'll see is a lot of redness. It's almost like a bad sunburn. So the, the end point that we're looking for is sort of this kind of darker red color sometimes with some crusting. And the usual treatment for the, the, the most common one that we use is about two weeks, twice a day for two weeks. And then we have a little reversal cream that you apply. And this is the patient, same patient, a few months later after all the inflammation has subsided. And you can see just visually the texture of his skin is improved. It's a lot more smooth. He doesn't have any scaling lesions or anything like that. So this is very, very helpful when you have a lot of um, small superficial lesions to treat in one whole area. Um, this is an example of a superficial and small skin cancer that we are treating with something called curatage. So these spots are um, numbed up with local anesthesia, and then we take a, a sharp metal instrument called a curette, and these superficial skin cancers are very easily removed with a sharp instrument, whereas normal skin really is, is um, very resistant to being scraped off. So this is by feel. We don't send anything to pathology, so you do want to make sure that your, you know, your provider is skilled in, in rendering this type of treatment. Um, this is a cartoon just kind of showing how this, this instrument physically, you know, just scrapes the cancer cells out. Um, we don't examine the edge, edges, so this is also important for us to make sure that, you know, in a few months nothing has grown back. So we'll transition now to types of skin cancers that we need to cut out. So as we mentioned previously, melanomas need to be cut out and also invasive skin cancer. So invasive squamous cell carcinomas, certain types and sizes of basal cell carcinomas as well. And this is really because these grow deeper into the skin and are inaccessible to our usual destructive methods such as scraping, freezing, and creams. So for these, you do physically need to cut it out with a scalpel and most of the time we'll stitch it up. So in terms of you know, the ways that we cut cancer, cut, cut skin cancers out. Um, the order's a little bit different in terms of uh, between conventional excision and Mohs micrographic surgery, which we'll briefly discuss. So with a conventional excision, uh, we'll cut out the cancer, stitch it closed, and then we'll send that specimen to the pathologist to confirm that all the margins are clear. So this is an example of a basal cell carcinoma um, that was biopsied. So you don't see the skin cancer anymore. You see the scar from the biopsy. So that's that inside circle. 
and then there's a certain distance that we're required to take. So it's called that's called the, the surgical margin. We have to be a certain distance away from the skin cancer, and that distance depends on the type of skin cancer as well. So for a routine basal cell cancer, that's about four millimeters, so less than a quarter of an inch. We'll cut this kind of diamond shape out and stitch it up right away. So this is the kind of post-excisional appearance. And then we'll take this specimen that was cut out, send it to our pathologist and confirm that all the cancer is out. So this is, this is most of the time completely adequate treatment for a skin cancer where you do check to make sure all the cancer's out. It's relatively a quick procedure. You'll probably take maybe 30 minutes or so. So the next option or the next type of excision that we'll talk about is Mohs micrographic surgery. The order is a little bit changed here. So in, in these instances or in this type of surgery, we will cut out the cancer. We will check in real time underneath the microscope in the office to confirm that all the margins are negative and then we'll stitch it. So both of these options, we confirm underneath the microscope that all the cancer is gone. But with Mohs surgery, we do that before we do any type of stitching or what we call reconstruction um, of that. And I usually like to explain it, um, you know, what the utility of Mohs is very, um, I would say it's helpful because we look at 100% of the margin in real time. So I'll, I usually explain it to patients like, you know, um, a pie with filling. So if your skin cancer is the filling and your margin that you care about, so you do what you want to do is you want to make sure you're around and underneath that skin cancer. So I think of that as like the crust of, of the pie. So what we care about is all the side edges all the way around and the, the side walls and the bottom of that crust is clear of tumor. So we look at actually all the side margins and all of the deep margins in real time. So we look at 100% of the margin, which really helps us both confirm that, the, that all the margins are truly negative, but it also offers the highest cure rate for skin cancers approaching, you know, nothing's ever 100%, but really approaching 99% for straightforward basal cell cancers. Um, and because we are able to check the margins in real time and look at 100% of the margins in real time, we can try to preserve as much normal healthy tissue as possible, which helps to sort of minimize or, or make the reconstruction a little bit more simple. So there are a few situations you might be wondering, when should we have, when do we decide to have a conventional excision? When do we decide who needs most surgery? So I'll show you just a few pictures where it might be important for us to use a microscope in real time to make sure all these cancer cells are gone before we fix it. So one would be if the edges of the cancer are hard to see. So on the left here, this is a traditional basal cell cancer. It's very easy, I would say, to draw a circle around the cancer to divide the cancer from normal skin, right? So this, this type of skin cancer, this appearance is usually that, you know, very adequately and successfully treated with a conventional excision because you can see the edges. In contrast, this is um, kind of a more aggressive form of basal cell cancer where it's really hard to see where the edges of the cancer start and stop. So you might not be confident that with a, with a conventional excision, you're going to get it all. So you might want to treat this one with Mohs micrographic surgery to make sure that you know everything's gone. Um, sometimes we see patients who have multiple skin cancers or suspicious areas close to the biopsy site. So this was a biopsy site for a squamous cell cancer, but when the patient showed up for a treatment, you can see there's a lot of other spots here that we aren't 100% sure if they're related to this initial lesion or not, and using the microscope in real time helps us delineate that. Um, sometimes when we have larger skin cancers on the face, we want to make sure that when we that that it's completely removed the first time around, so that we don't, you know, set patients up for an additional procedure, especially on areas um, that are, I would say, functionally and cosmetically important, such as the face. Um, so this is a patient before Mohs surgery, and you can see after Mohs surgery, she's had her appearance restored to normal. Um, this is another example of a basal cell cancer that's in a functionally and cosmetically sensitive location, which required a more, I would say, I would call not necessarily complicated, but more involved reconstructive surgery um, 
which you want to make sure that you don't have to redo because you have positive margins. So this is her before the surgery and this is after she had something called a paramedian forehead flap repair. And you can see she's also, you know, she has um, good restoration of her appearance. This is yet another example of a large skin cancer where the reconstructive surgery is a little bit more extensive. So we do wanna make sure that before we move all this, this skin into this area that all the skin cancer is gone because to have to go back for, for recurrence or for positive margins would be a lot more challenging the second time around. And this last one is just an example of a, of a patient who had a skin cancer treated with a conventional excision and unfortunately the, pot, the margins were positive. And so when you have this um, it's very challenging to tell exactly where along the scar you still have some skin cancer left. And so that's when it is helpful to use the microscope to, to basically show us where there's still cancer left and to ensure that everything is removed before we do you know, another round of reconstruction. So in terms of our take home messages, there's basically two big categories of treatment options for skin cancers. Destructive treatments, scraping, freezing, topical creams, which are best for precancers called actinic keratoses and very small or superficial basal cell cancers and squamous cell cancers. There are excisional modalities. Um, the two that we talked about are conventional excision and Mohs surgery. And for those are really most appropriate for all melanomas and also for invasive skin cancers. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. So I will um, open it to the floor for questions. Um, and I'm, I just opened up the question and answer. So since I'm looking right at it, I'll just answer um, a couple questions that I'm seeing here, if that's okay. So um, this question is for, from Mr. Hayes. And his question is, is it better to get Mohs at a transplant center rather than the local dermatologic center? Um, and I would say it, um, it depends, right? I think it depends on your need. Um, for a very straightforward basal cell, squamous cell cancer, um, I think it's completely appropriate to get your Mohs surgery done at your local Mohs surgeon who is fellowship trained and has completed a, a fellowship through the American College of Mohs Surgery. Um, I would say if you need more extensive, um, either resection or reconstruction for a more advanced skin cancer, or you need Mohs surgery for a melanoma, um, or you have so many skin cancers that your, your local dermatologist is having trouble keeping up with the number of biopsies that you'll need, I would say it may be more efficient um, and, and maybe you might have, a, um, I would say, a better uh, team put together for you at an academic center such as Penn. Um, and then uh, Tammy Robinson also had a great question, it says, how come you wouldn't use Mohs surgery for all melanoma? Um, and that is a really good question. So the reason why um, is, so Mohs surgery for melanoma, is a very specialized technique. And so we're very lucky at Penn. We're one of three centers where we really develop this technique most for melanoma, where we use a special stain to highlight melanoma cells. And so we have learned over the past, over a decade now that we've been doing it, we've done more than 2000 cases at this point. Um, we've learned that it, it's, it's a very specialized technique that requires extra training. And so it's not necessarily appropriate or needed for all melanoma. So for example, melanomas that are on the arms and legs, the, you know, the chest, abdomen, and back, that's called the trunk and extremities, the, the rates of recurrence are really about 2% after a wide local excision, a conventional excision. And the rates of having a positive margin after a wide local excision is also about 2%, so very low. So those melanomas in those areas are very successfully treated with a wide local excision. Um, in contrast, melanomas on what we call specialty sites, the head, the neck, hands, feet, and genitalia, the, the rate of having a recurrence in those, in those areas after a wide local excision is about 10%. And the rate of having a positive margin, meaning you're gonna need more surgery and more reconstruction in those areas is also 10%. So much higher, like five-fold higher. So those are really the melanomas that would benefit most from what we call margin control or confirming negative margins before reconstruction. That is a really great question. Hi, Dr. Shin, it's Talia. 
Hey. Um, hi. So I think it might be helpful um, as well if you do answer some of the other questions that were posed and um, were already answered live in case people didn't look at the Q&A, um, maybe around uh, some of the ones around like the difference in SPFs, like 50 versus 70. And then someone asked about getting cancer on your lips and then how quickly you should see a dermatologist after a transplant. Sure. Yeah. And then maybe Beth, are you available? I know Beth answered a lot of those questions since she gave her talk first. So um, yeah. Wonderful. Thanks, Beth. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of the, um, there were a couple questions on SPF. So there was one about um, the SPF number. The, um, one patient is using SPF 30. She wanted to know, should I look for something higher? So in terms of your SPF, so 30 or higher is ideal. Um, you know, if you go higher, you're getting a little bit more protection. So a, a SPF of 30 blocks about 97% of the UV rays, whereas an SPF of 50 is blocking about 98%. So really not that much more. Um, it's really most important to reapply the sunscreen um, so that you're continually getting that, you know, 97, 98% protection throughout the day if you're going to be out for long periods of time. Um, and again, that's why we're also recommending a lot of the ultraviolet protective factor clothing because um, you might not keep track of how often you are, you know, reapplying throughout the day. So um, the, the clothing is really a great option. And there was another question on the clothing, um, if it's kind of heavy or um, can be a little sweaty. And most of them are really um, lightweight. So um, not really uncomfortable or hot, um, you know, because obviously most people are wearing them in the summer months. So um, they tend to be kind of lightweight and nice. So and I think that was, um, I think that answered probably two questions that I had done. And then there was another question on the chemical versus mineral sunscreen. So um, I had kind of briefly touched on that as well. Um, so there's kind of a lot of still sort of debate about it. I mean, um, the chemical sunscreens, both both are good. They just work a little bit differently. Um, what I will say is some people don't love using a chemical sunscreen because the zinc can be a little bit thick um, and go on a little pasty. So, you know, some people are turned off by using those types of um, sunscreens. So I typically say like, again, use whatever whatever you're going to use on the skin is um is preferred so if you don't like those sunscreens then um find a chemical sunscreen that you're going to use and reapply and then someone um someone asked actually too now about skin cancer on the lips Dr. Steele, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so we do, we definitely do see skin cancers on the lips and particularly the lower lip. Um, so that's an area that is definitely exposed to the sun. And it's also an area that sometimes people forget to apply sunscreen. So definitely important, um, you know, as we've said multiple times, make sure that you have a broad brimmed hat as well as sunscreen on the face. And there are a number of companies that make lip balm that has SPF 30 or higher. So getting one of those um, it can also be helpful. The lips tend to be somewhat sensitive. Um, so um, some of the um, lip balms with zinc oxide um, or the um, physical blockers may be um, less irritating for the lips. So those are good options. Um, but skin cancer on, on the lips are actually um, sort of a high risk location. So we do, um, you know, want to make sure that you're protecting your the lips for sure from the sun. And then I think there was also a question about um, how soon after your transplant should you see a dermatologist. So we recommend being seen within a year of your transplant for a baseline skin check. Um, what we really see is that three to five years after your transplant is when we, we start to see the increased risk for skin cancer for many transplant patients, because at that point you've been on your anti-rejection medicines um, your, uh, that suppress the immune system you know, for several years, and we're, we'll start to see higher rates of skin cancer at that point. Um, but we want everyone to be seen within a year of transplant, because um, if you have other risk factors like um, a, a history of skin cancer or um, yourself or a family history of skin cancer, then we may want to be following you more closely 
um, than once a year. So um, within a year, you should see us and we can make a plan moving forward. Thanks. And then someone had asked, um, which I think a lot of people forget about, um, like skin cancer on your head. Like, you know, me, especially, I always have a part in my hair and I totally forget about that part. Um, so how about that? Like protecting yourself and the, um, how often that might be susceptible to skin cancer. Naomi, do you want to take that one? I see you answered a, that question in the chat box. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Okay, it was having some issues with the microphone earlier, I'm sorry. Um, so yes, we got a really good question about the skin cancer on the top of the head and how often do we see it. Um, it is seen often in patients who I believe have more like thinning hair or hair loss at the top of the head a lot of times. Um, and then like you said, Talia, that part area, you know, you forget to sunscreen that and often people will burn up there. So it really does um, play a part in your risk for skin cancer, um, especially in our transplant patients. So it's really important to get that broad brim hat on, uh, preferably with UPF fabric so that it's blocking that uh, sun out. And if you're somebody who doesn't tend to like wearing hats, I would say really get that sunscreen actually in the scalp. Um, so I would say better option is probably wear the hat, but it is important to protect it because we do see it. Thank you. Um, so we have like another minute. Is there any like closing thoughts that um, you guys have for our participants? I just see one more um, question over here in the chat um, about a SPF daily moisturizer. Um, the question is, is SPF and a daily moisturizer good enough to use versus a regular uh, facial sunscreen? So um, just to answer that one, I would, um, you know, a lot of the daily uh, facial moisturizers that have SPF might not be um, particularly water resistant. So um, if you're going to be outdoors and like swimming, sweating, those sorts of things, you want to make sure that you're using more of a water resistant rather than your daily SPF um, in your facial moisturizer. I think that was all the questions, hopefully. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. And it's, I think, especially uh, for people who wear makeup, like I know that mine has SPF, but I'm not reapplying it very frequently. So it is a really great reminder that that's really not all that needs to be done. Um, so thank you to all our speakers today on this topic. I think, you know, with transplant, it's a thing that not a lot of patients really realize is so important to be aware of. Um, and this information was so helpful. And um, regardless of transplant, it's really important to take care of our skin and, and make sure we're protecting ourselves. So thanks everyone for participating. We'll